Today's video is a combination of some of the worst mountaineering tragedies that I have covered on this channel. From being stuck in a crevasse, stranded in snowstorms on the slopes of some of the tallest mountains in the world, or freezing to death on the Savage Mountain. We go through it all. Hit that like and subscribe button, and as always, viewer discretion is advised. K2, nicknamed the Savage Mountain. There are very few peaks more famous than this 8,611 meter death trap. The second highest mountain on earth, but much more dangerous than Everest. A challenge that only the brave and most determined would even think about attempting. The weather is notoriously rough for climbers, consistently causing avalanches that obstruct paths leaving hidden crevasses layered throughout the mountain, waiting for someone to step into its trap. Mistakes on any mountain can be deadly, but on K2, they are particularly costly. In 1986, Renato Casarato, one of the strongest Italian climbers from his time, would soon learn the dangers that K2 holds. This is his story. K2 still stands as the only 8,000 meter peak that has not been climbed on its eastern face. Almost all summit attempts have to be done in summer months, with the first winter summit being accomplished just last year in 2021. Casarato would attempt to summit K2 from the south-southwest spur route, a very challenging route compared to others, and if he was successful, it would mean he would be the first to summit following this path. You see, Casarato was no stranger to discovering or climbing partially rough routes to summit mountains. Looking back at his career, one would almost say he relished the opportunity. No, he welcomed and seeked the opportunity. He brought a style of mountain climbing not too popular at the time, but one that is legendary. Casarato rushed to conquer the 8000ers in alpine style, light and without oxygen. In a film about Casarato called Solo di Cordata, he is described as repeating or opening routes on great walls, often in the cold season, refusing radio connections, external support, or other equipment to be deposited along the route. He had chosen total isolation, favoring prolonged stays on the walls, regardless of the cold, the blizzards, and other very real dangers. Through alpinism, he was able to dive deep within his human conditions, pushing his limits until he would find the key to overcome them. Casarato would open routes on the north wall of Rascaran, untouched northeasterner pillar of Fitzroy, and completed an extraordinary ascent on the north ridge of Broad Peak. Additionally, in 1982, four years before he would travel to K2, Casarato spent 15 days on the three months route of Mont Blanc in the dead of winter, spanning multiple days in a blizzard, pushing his body to its limits and then beyond, overcoming fear and insecurity, finding the ability to continue through sheer determination. He was a pioneer in discovering what the human body was capable of. These are just a few of his accomplishments, and I can go on and on. It is safe to say that in 1980s, there were few better climbers in the world. But even with all these accomplishments, Casarato still was left feeling like he was missing something. A crown jewel of all of his achievements, if you will, which he decided would be his summit of the Savage Mountain. Casarato planned to follow a route that was attempted by a French expedition in 1979 but failed to reach the summit. If he was successful, it would mean he had just opened up a new route to reach the summit of K2. The route is called the South Southwest Spur, very similar to the magic line route that would be successfully summited in the same year as Casarado's attempts. But there would be a slight variation to the right once he reached the upper part. However, being the person Casarado was, he planned to attempt this beast of a mountain solo meaning he would be up there alone with nobody to help. Because the climb could span over a week, one is subjected to the harsh conditions for a longer period of time, greatly increasing the bodily risk. Which also means the longer one spins on the mountain, the more time one is susceptible to the common risks that K2 can produce. In the summer of 1986, he arrived at K2 with his wife, determined to open a new route to the summit. The preparation began sometime in June, with Casarato's wife remaining at base camp to support from below. For the most part, his attempts to summit remained consistent with how Casarato expected. 
the weather and temperatures were harsh. He was very acclimated with this environment. So on June 23rd, the first summit attempt would begin. Casarado managed to make it past the 8,200 meter mark, only 400 meters from the summit, but had to turn around due to the harsh conditions he was experiencing. It is said that the weather had increasingly gotten worse and for safety reasons, Casarado would abandon the attempt. Although the first attempt failed, Casarado was not dismayed. In fact, it only appeared to fuel his desire to conquer the majestic mountain. Without leaving the site, another attempt was planned. And on July 5th, Casarado would again reach the same location as before, right around the 8,200 meter mark. But like last time, Casarado was forced to abandon his attempt as well. It seemed like the mountain was howling at him, telling him something, pleading for him to listen. But the thought of abandoning the summit attempt did not cross his mind. He was infected with summit fever. One did not become the climber that Casarado was by stopping when things got impossible. No, they broke through the barrier and made the task possible, forging new paths. So on July 16th, Casarado for the third time attempted to summit. Despite the harsh conditions, he managed to reach a higher point on this attempt at 8,300 meters. Now only just 300 meters from the summit. But just like the last two attempts, the weather turned for the worse and made conditions too harsh to continue. Casarado was an expert at knowing his limits and prioritizing safety. His life was not worth reaching the summit. But it was hard not to feel a little discouraged. This was his third attempt, and although he had managed to get so close by himself, it was still not what Casarado desired to accomplish. There was no doubt in his mind. He would continue his attempts to reach the summit. Under freezing temperatures and violent winds, Casarado descended down after his attempt, making it all the way to the foot of the mountain where the Di Felipe Glacier was located. The most technical aspects of the climb were behind him, and the weather was improving, so Casarado began to relax. Only an hour left to make it back to base camp, where he would be greeted with the sight of his wife. But Casarado did not realize that because of the storm, a snow bridge on the Di Felipe Glacier had become unstable. Back at base camp, Casarado's descent was being observed by a famous Austrian mountaineer named Kurt Damberger. It was about this time that Casarado would take a fatal step onto an unsecured snow bridge and fall into a crevasse. Kurt watched with horror as one moment he could spot a climber descending and another moment he was gone. One second, Casarado was walking on the snow bridge on top of the De Felipe Glacier and the next he was falling. His body was thrown violently against the ice and he slid deeper and deeper before being brought to a stop. He had just fallen 40 meters down, stuck with walls surrounding him. Being as experienced as he was, he knew immediately what had happened. He was stuck deep in a crevasse, any climber's worst nightmare. Casarado was an expert on his body and what it could handle, but even this situation felt dire to him. His body was in immense pain. He could barely move and surely could not make it out of this hellhole alone. After a minute or two, Casarado was able to maneuver his body just enough to access his rucksack. In doing so, he found what he was looking for, his radio. He calmly turned on the device and managed to call for help despite his pain praying that someone was listening. Kurt could not believe his eyes. He was watching a climber descend K2 and was near the base when he suddenly vanished. The feeling of dread sat in his stomach as he took a minute to gather his thoughts. Kurt anxiously waited for a sign, any sign that the climber was okay. But as he waited, there was nothing. It was in this moment of waiting that Kurt remembered his radio. Quickly, he turned it on and heard a voice. It was Casarado calling for help. Kurt could not believe it, but he was alive and conscious. Remembering Casarado's wife, Greta, he rushed to where she was located and quickly explained the situation. As soon as she heard what happened, Casarado's wife leapt into action. Greta called out for her husband over the radio in a very low, muffled voice, almost like he was whispering. She heard, Greta, I am dying in a crevasse near base camp. The sun was setting, but the entire base camp jumped into action. A search party was formed, which consisted Italian, British, and German climbers, including some doctors. 
Because Casarada's descent was being monitored, they knew immediately where to begin searching. It was not long before the teams discovered where he was located, but getting him out alive would be a grueling and demanding process, one that now had to be accomplished in the dark. Hour after hour continued as they tried different approaches. Each man knew that with every passing second, Casarado's chances of survival were lower and lower. Through this entire process, he remained conscious and would attempt to help the rescuers when he could. Eventually, the teams managed to move Casarado to the surface. Relieved to be finally out of the crevasse, he attempted to take a step, but immediately collapsed to the ground. He was in a lot of pain, but thought it was manageable. However, his body was running on adrenaline and was in much worse shape than originally thought. Even though he was conscious, it quickly became apparent that Casarado was dying. The doctors that were on site tended to his needs, but not much could be done, as most of his injuries were internal. The teams were nervous to begin moving him, as his condition was worsening by the minute. But all teams ferociously worked to improve his condition, but with little to no avail. It was just too late. The fall had damaged his internal organs badly. Shortly after he was raised to the surface, he died of internal bleeding. Nobody had to say a word. Every man there felt his presence. It was a huge blow to the entire mountaineering community. It honestly feels surreal. How can he be gone? Casarado lived his life to the fullest, not backing down from any challenge. Everyone that knew him there almost expected him to grit his teeth and raise his head, but it was not to be. Following the wishes of his wife, Renato Casarato would be laid to rest in the same crevasse that took his life. After 17 years, his remains would re-emerge in August of 2003. It was at this time that his body would be transported to the Gilke Memorial, and in 2005, a plaque was donated by the CAI of Arzinino. He was beloved by his community, praised for his feats. Nobody could describe Casarato better than his own words. Taken from a letter on the same day of his death, he would state, The route is tremendously difficult and has tested me to the limit. It is one of the hardest routes in the Himalayas and the Karakoram. I hope to be the first to climb it. Nobody could deny the greatness that he embodied. His determination never wavered, even until his dying breath. There are very few climbers that uncovered new routes, overcame impossible challenges, and just overall enjoyed mountaineering as a whole. This story is dedicated to his legacy left behind and for all those brave enough to follow the pathways he defined. Lillianne and Maurice Berard did not live a life that many would consider normal. The French mountaineering pair seemed destined to be together ever since they met while climbing in South America. It was the perfect match, as both individuals loved traveling and climbing high altitude peaks. They climbed primarily by using alpine style, moving quickly without much gear, and would be known to focus their interests mainly on the peaks in the Himalayan and Karakoram ranges. Anyone who is familiar with mountains understands that these two ranges are the pinnacle for all high altitude climbers, with the highest peak being Everest, located in the Himalayas, and the second highest peak being K2, located on the Karakorams. Today, we will focus on the latter just mentioned, the Karakoram Range, but more specifically, the Savage Mountain, K2. In 1986, Lillian and Maurice Berard would scrap together just enough finances and travel to K2. This is their story. K2, it is said to be so mystical to climbers that once one sets their eyes on its beauty, they won't be able to forget her. That the mountain can be so mesmerizing, almost like calling to climbers. Or at least, that's what they say. But it's hard to deny the marvel, intimidation, or even the intrigue that such a majestic sight is said to behold. Standing at 28,251 feet, the second highest peak known to man is a deadly challenge. K2 has been classified as a much harder and riskier climb than that of its counterpart, Everest. This can mainly be credited to the harsh weather conditions that K2 can experience. Avalanches are more common, conditions are not suitable for long-term life, and there are hidden traps laying underneath one's feet. The thrill of achieving a summit on such a beast is very high. 
but so is the risk. But to the mountaineering couple, deemed the world's highest couple, this thrill was exactly what the pair seeked. And in 1982, they would summit Gasher Broom 2. In 1984, the couple would ascend Nanga Parbat, with Lillianne being the first female ascent of this peak, as well as attempting a summit on Makalu, but narrowly missing the peak due to bad weather. They would accomplish all of this in preparation for the hardest climb of their lives, K2. The Berard's love for mountaineering only grew over the years, as did their experience, and in June of 1986, they would gather enough funds to coordinate a summit attempt of K2. Their attempt would not be alone, as they put together a small team consisting of Polish climber Wanda Rutkiewicz and French climber Michael Parmenter. Over the years, Wanda Rutkiewicz would be considered one of the most accomplished early female alpinists to ever live. She was very excited to partner up with the Berards, as the respect was mutual between the two. Ironically, the Berards' first challenge that they would experience in their trip to K2 wouldn't even be at the start of the mountain, but actually in the cab ride leading up to their trip. Whether it would be excitement or carelessness, Maurice and Lillian had left their passports plane tickets and the entire funds for the expedition in the backseat of a taxi. A nuisance to anyone that was about to take on the hardest challenge of their lives. But instead, they had to worry about losing a couple of dollars. The situation was quickly resolved once they noticed their mistake and were on their way. Eventually, they would meet up with Wanda and Michael in a motel that caters to K2 mountain climbers. Because of the timing of their attempt, they weren't the only ones preparing for the summit. And among this group would be Alan Rouse, the first British mountaineer that would summit K2. It would be from this location that the team would head to the base camp and begin their expedition. The team of four would begin their summit attempt on June 18th 1986. Overall, the expedition started off as almost all do, smoothly and without any hiccups. The team had thoroughly discussed their plan the day before, and they were all aware of the route they were going to take. They were going to attempt the most common summit route up K2, the Abruzzi Spur. They would not bring supplemental oxygen, as their goal was to be lightweight and quick. However, their attempt would be the first of the season, which would provide additional challenges to the group. There would be no camp set up ahead of them to assist as needed, and additionally, all paths would be drowned in snow, leaving no clear areas to step and no established ropes to assist the climbers. Essentially, they were creating the path for the climbers behind them to follow up the mountain. All four would spend their first night at the 6,300 meter mark. Their progress was slow, but steady throughout their attempt. And the second night, they would reach the 7,100 meter mark and rest there. Followed by the third day at the 7,700 meter mark and the fourth day at the 7,900 meter mark. The fourth day, the progress is slow as the weather had worsened and both women at this point were struggling to continue. Maurice was visibly exhausted as the tolls of the Savage Mountain weighed on the group, and Michael, the only one of the group that seemed to be in a stable mind, became more and more concerned with the safety of everyone, as it was clear their progress was not what they had hoped for. That night, there would be a discussion on whether the team should continue. Eventually, they all agreed to attempt the summit tomorrow. Despite their physical and mental exhaustion, not one member of the team had made it this far by quitting. However, the next day would not be any easier. The Berards, Wanda and Michael, would only make it to the 8,300 meter mark, only about 300 meters away from the summit. The night would be so cold that they would have to pitch one tent and all huddle together inside conserving as much heat as possible. Overall, the mood of the camp was not positive as each member had to remind each other of why they were there to begin with. And according to Michael, this night was the worst of their ascent, as each member of the group was struggling to feel healthy or even happy. Because the group's progress was slower than expected, they had not prepared for a long trek, and their supplies were depleting extremely fast. And most importantly, they were running out of fuel for their miniature stove, a key tool for alpinists in the 1980s, as this was their source of water. The snow can be taken and melted down to drink, and therefore not having enough fuel can be life-threatening in bad conditions. The next morning, June 23rd, all four members arose from the tent, having barely slept the night before, and began their trek to the summit. 
The terrain was absolutely brutal. Jagged rocks lay hidden underneath feet of snow, and they stood on the slope just under the summit looking at the task in front of them. The trail lay behind them where other climbers would follow, but their work wasn't done. Wanda today felt better than the previous night, and most of that can be credited to the excitement of a K2 summit. She would be the first of the group to reach the top, marking her as the first woman to summit K2. 45 minutes later, the Berards and Michael would reach the summit as well, making Lillian only the second woman to ever summit K2. A historical moment for both of them, as they wrote their names in the history book. The weather could not have been more perfect that day, and there was no wind, and the skies were clear, providing a beautiful view of the landscape. The mountain had finally rewarded them for their persistence, and Michael would later say, I felt like I was on the beach, because the weather was so nice. Just as the group had climbed up, they must now climb down. However, the Berard's health seemed to be worse than the day before, so much to the point that they were slowing down Wanda and Michael, and just as quickly as they had summited, they returned to the 8,300 meter mark where the Berards began setting up camp for the night. Wanda could hardly believe what they were doing. She knew the team needed to get off the mountain. An unspoken rule in the mountaineering community at that time was that after you reach the summit, you descend like your life depends on it. This was to avoid all potential risks not just with the mountain, but one's own bodily health. But despite their efforts to convince them, they set up camp and settled in for the night. They had just used their last bit of stove fuel, leaving nothing left. Michael and Wanda were both terrified at this point and feared for their lives. So much so that Wanda resorted to taking sleeping pills just to take her mind off the situation. They did not agree with the decision-making of the Berards, but were unable to oppose it. They wanted to move and fast. Nobody slept much all night. The team packed up on the morning of July 24th and continued their descent. Michael would lead, followed by Wanda, and then the Berards. Because they had no fuel, it was discussed that they needed to keep moving until they reached camp or other climbers that had supplies before settling in for the night. And each individual was feeling the harsh effects of a prolonged stay on the mountain and began to focus solely on their own survival. Wanda would later state, I was the only one who could help myself at this altitude. The weather began to turn for the worse as their time was running out. Snow began to fall and winds could be heard howling to the sky and visibility worsened by the hour. Michael made steady work off the mountain, creating a footpath to follow so it was easier for the team. But the Berards were slow, really slow, and Wanda lagged behind with them for a while but eventually would catch up to Michael. Turning around, Michael and Wanda could see the Berard's silhouettes in the distance. They were not left with many options as they watched the small black figures move against the bright snow. They could not slow down. Wanda and Michael managed to make it to camp, 7,700 meters, where they were greeted by an Italian expedition. In terrible shape, they both warmed their bodies as they replenished their strength. The fierce wind was brutal when combined with the snowfall, and visibility continued to get worse as time went on. All they could do was pray that the Berards would arrive at camp in a few hours. But when they failed to make it to camp, there was little that could be done. Little hope was kept as the mood at the camp began to turn sour, and eventually the morning had passed, and it was time to move on. Conditions were increasingly difficult to manage as a decision had to be made, to stay and wait, or to descend. At this point, Michael was hoping somehow that the Berards would make it, but others in the camp were not as optimistic, and ultimately Michael would stay and wait while the Italians and Wanda descended to escape the conditions. They left behind a small radio for Michael to use as a last resort, and with one final word of encouragement, they left camp, desperate to get off the mountain. As Wanda and the Italian climbers descended, things did not get any easier and there were small makeshift camps along the way left by other climbers, but ultimately their destination would be base camp. Wanda and company managed to make it to the 7,000 meter camp where they would wait for Michael and the Berards. However, Wanda began experiencing the early stages of frostbite in her fingers and toes, which would become a deadly problem if it developed further. They made the decision to continue their descent. Dark clouds began to obscure the sky as the snowfall became heavier and heavier, a bad omen for Michael. 
as they knew he was higher up on the mountain. Eventually, Wanda would make it back safely to base camp, and they began treatment on her as she settled in, relieved to be off the mountain. She was exhausted, and her frostbite had developed to the point where she was unable to do simple tasks. But her attitude surprised some, as she was cheerful and couldn't stop smiling. Her companion's whereabouts were still unknown, but understandably, she couldn't be more relieved. Back at the 7,700 meter camp, and a few hours after Wanda had left, Michael faced an impossible decision. The weather was making his stomach turn over, as the clouds did not look inviting. Snow had already begun falling for some time, and the Berards had not made it to camp. Eventually, he made the difficult decision to continue the descent. Michael made fantastic pace as he was practically running down the mountain. There was a great incentive to move fast as visibility was getting worse and worse due to the snowfall, and it felt as though the dark clouds looming over him were waiting for a slip up. As he got closer and closer to base camp, conditions turned to a whiteout. Combined with gale force winds, Michael was only able to see a few feet in front of him, and it would not take much to trigger an avalanche in these conditions, something that K2 was famous for. He descended for hours, each step praying that there was firm snow underneath, and it would be very easy for Michael to make one fatal move off the path and into darkness. Visibility had gotten so bad that around the 3,000 meter mark, Michael was unable to continue on his own for fear of stepping off route. Luckily, the radio that was left behind came in handy as he used it to call for help. And with the help of directions from base camp and a few landmarks he had stumbled upon, Michael was able to navigate his way through the remaining descent. Tired, hungry, and cold, he stumbled his way to safety. As members of base camp rushed to his aid, he only managed to mutter out two words, and Wanda. Both Wanda and Michael would survive the ordeal, but the Berards were not so lucky. The most likely scenario is that they were caught in the storm, fell off path, and collapsed from exhaustion. It is not known why the Berards were so slow to descend. Michael and Wanda would both later admit that they were too caught up in their own thoughts to pay much attention to help. Lillian's body was found a month later by a South Korean team in a snowfield at the 5,330 meter mark. Maurice would not be found until 1998, 12 years after the ordeal, on a glacier above base camp. Both are now buried at the Gilkey Memorial. Lillian and Maurice were lovers that died following their passion together, two of the few victims that K2 has claimed. This story serves as a reminder to all those that dare attempt to summit the Savage Mountain. Mount Denali, a name that translates to the Great One, a fitting title for a mountain standing at 20,320 feet, making it the tallest peak in all of North America. After the group of four or the Staheli expedition reached the summit, they would soon realize the harsh reality of the Great One. A story about survival at all costs, even if that means the sacrifice of others. This is their story. On May 11, 2011, Mount Denali was cold, especially at the high camp of 17,200 feet. The team of six, Jerry O'Sullivan, Dave Staheli, Beat Niederer, Lawrence Cutler, Tony Diskin, and Henry Munter had been resting for two days at the high camp waiting for the weather to present an opportunity to attempt a summit, but today was that day. Although it was minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, the group would take the opportunity with only a slight breeze outside their camp. They were expecting harsh winds later in the day and may not get another chance. You see, what made Mount Denali one of the most dangerous mountains in the world, much less North America, was not only the size, the treacherous glaciers, risk of avalanches, high altitude sickness, but above all else, the location. The mountain is in the northern latitude of the world, making it not only extremely cold, but unpredictable. One morning, the skies could be clear and sunny, and within hours, an entirely different landscape would be outside. White out blizzards, where you would not be able to see your hand if you held it right in front of your face. Staheli, along with the other group members, knew this, and on the morning of May 11th, they jumped on what could be their only opportunity to summit the mountain. Staheli, along with Munter, were guides for the mountain trip, 
who was one of six companies that were allowed to guide expeditions up the mountain. The original group that set out was made up of nine members, six clients and three guides. However, one member had descended after climbing halfway up the mountain with another expedition that was on their way down, leaving eight to reach the high camp. The group dropped two more at the 17,200 foot mark when the least experienced guide would stay behind with a healthy client who did not want to attempt the summit, leaving six that would make the push. While all members were conditioned and prepared for the climb, the clients heavily relied on the two guides to direct and provide instruction up the mountain. On a climb like Mount Denali, many climbers focus solely on the guide in front of them, following behind one step after another. This is particularly the case at high altitudes, when the air becomes thin and the brain begins to slow down. It is the exact reason why there are strict rules and regulations for guides since they quite literally hold the lives of others in their hands. 57-year-old Stahili, a strong and fit build man, was the longest serving guide for Mount Denali at the time and was the team leader of the group. He started his career with legendary climber Ray Gannett and was guiding climbers up the mountain in 1982. In fact, to the locals, he himself is considered an Alaskan legend after he was the first climber to solo the west rib of Denali in the winter. It is safe to say that he knew better than anyone the risks on the mountain. Since Mount Denali was covered in glaciers, there are slightly more risks than a normal peak. Glaciers are a giant mass of slow moving ice that are known for having large chunks of rock fall away tumbling down the mountain preparing to take out unexpected climbers. If the dangers from above was not enough, there is an even more sinister danger below your feet. A crevasse is a crack in the ice that can be hundreds of feet deep. Looking over one, you'd be staring at beautiful blue walls leading further down into a black void that will take your breath away and make your heart stop all at once. These were the real dangers of glacier climbing, as falling into one almost always leads to certain death. To protect against this, along with regular falls, the team ascends and descends the mountain with a rope, connected to each member and anchored into pickets. This means if one were to fall into the crevasse, it would be up to the others to dig their spike boots and ice axes into the snow and brace their bodies along with the prayer that the anchors will hold to stop the fall. Although if the remaining team members are not quick enough on their feet, it would mean the entire group is dragged into the void or down the mountain to their deaths. Ensuring the rope was attached to each member along with carrying other survival supplies such as a sleeping bag, communication equipment, a shovel, and extra anchors were the responsibilities of Stahili and Munter as the guides. On the morning of May 11, 2011, Stahili would forget to pack a sleeping bag and shovel while he was prepping the group for a busy day and a dangerous climb. It was a very easy mistake in the rush of the early hours of the morning at high altitudes, but it would be a mistake that he would never forget and cost them dearly in the hours to come. The team would set out from the high camp with a long day ahead of them. They would be attached together in groups of three, one guide and two climbers, with Stahili leading the entire group. Up to this point, the group of eight had made their way up the mountain over the last couple of days with no incidents. In fact, things were going really well, and the group was in good spirits as they had reached the high camp on May 9th. The previous week was spent climbing up the west buttress route of the mountain, stopping at the three previous camps along the route to rest before reaching the fourth and final high camp on May 9th. The plan in the morning was to leave the high camp following the ridge through the autobahn a technical and steep area of the route to Denali Pass. After resting, they would proceed up the pass to the football field at 19,500 feet, which was a large flat area where climbers could relax before making the final push up Pig Hill then to the summit. A common saying in mountaineering is that things are going great until they aren't. And to that point, things were going smoothly as the group reached the bottom of Denali Pass. Because of the temperatures, Tony Diskin began to develop frostbite in his hands and had to make the difficult decision to turn around with Munter as his guide and descend it back to high camp. This would reduce the group to four, and more important, Stahili would have to shepherd the other three climbers all attached to one rope 
although a seamless, insignificant detail, if there was a fall, this would increase the weight Staheli would have to brace for and make the expedition significantly more dangerous. They climbed on, without incident, reaching the football field after climbing for nine hours. Cutler was struggling at this point, and it took constant encouragement from Staheli for him to make it this far. Staheli gave him the option to wait there for the group to summit and return, but after a short rest, Cutler stood with the others, his face completely determined. He was making the summit, and nobody in the world could stop him. Two hours later, the group of four would take the last couple of steps. One step up, then another, then over the ridge. They had reached the summit. Standing on top of the Great One, it really felt like the tallest mountain in North America. As they looked at each other, grinning ear to ear and exchanging high fives, the wind began to pick up, reaching 15 miles per hour. But they did not care, because in those few moments, there was no better feeling in the world. They did not have long to soak in being on top of the world, so after taking a swig of water, they reluctantly put their gear back on, took one last look before taking the first step down the mountain. It took them minutes to reach Pig Hill. They were making good time and it was needed as the ascent had been a below average pace. The weather was beginning to change for the worst. O'Sullivan was in the middle of the group as they descended Pig's Hill, following Staheli. Each step from the group was in response to their guide, one step following the man in front of you. In the middle of the road, O'Sullivan lifted his foot from the ice as he had done a thousand times before, but this time was different. This step was different. As he extended his leg to take a step, the crampons, or teeth that were attached to the bottom of his shoes, would catch on to his gaiter, a thick coat of clothing that protected the climber's lower legs, almost like a very large and thick sock that goes on the outside of your clothes. Unpredictable, yet a simple mistake. O'Sullivan tripped, a step that would change the lives of so many. The group had no time to react. In fact, before any of the members even knew what was happening, they were all sliding down the mountain like ragdolls. They were at the mercy of the Great One. After falling about 500 feet, the group stopped in the football field, but the damage was done. O'Sullivan's leg was broken. Staheli had hit his head during the fall, creating a 4 centimeter gash, leaving him confused and in a daze. He had a few broken ribs, but the most dangerous thing that happened were his fingers in the early stages of frostbite due to him clawing at the snow throughout the fall in an attempt to slow the group down. Niederer had cracked ribs and Cutler had strained his back, and at this point the weather had turned for the worse. The winds were picking up significantly by the minute. The four men were quick to realize that this was a worst case scenario. Staheli, dazed and fumbling, pulled out his satellite phone and with frostbitten hands began to pull the antenna when, crack, it was broken, and they were now really alone. The four exchanged somber looks. Not a word was said for seconds. Reality set in. In the confusion, Niederer and Cutler began moving across the football field to see if they could get a signal on an old handheld radio or at the very least contact high camp. While they began the trek, Staheli moved O'Sullivan into a bivy sack and began dragging him, barely able to hold on to him as he was losing the ability to move his fingers through the thick gloves. One step at a time, pulling with every ounce of energy in his body. Suddenly, the ever-increasing winds blew the bivy sack away, leaving O'Sullivan exposed to the elements. Staheli did not think, he just continued to drag O'Sullivan and after a hundred yards, he reached the end of the football field. What Staheli didn't say was that the entire time he was dragging O'Sullivan across that flat area at 19,000 feet, he was thinking that he would not be able to safely bring him down the mountain. He couldn't say it, but he knew that he would have to leave him. With a broken leg and furious winds with nothing but his clothes to protect him. He should have had a sleeping bag or a shovel that would have provided the ability to build a snow shelter and provide safety from the brutal winds. But Staheli had not brought those items, so instead he took off his insulated parka and wrapped it around O'Sullivan with a promise. A promise to send help. They were just under the summit, and it would be a long trek through the night to reach high camp. Factor in the time to organize a rescue, 
and both climbers knew. They both knew as they looked at each other. O'Sullivan did not have the time that it would take. So it was this realization and understanding that Stahili took one last look before stepping off the football field, turning his head and taking a step down the mountain. Stahili put himself in serious danger giving up his parka and knew his only chance was to keep moving in the negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures. Seconds felt like minutes, minutes felt like hours, hours felt like days. It was midnight by the time Stahili caught up with Cutler and Niederer at the northwest side of Archdeacon's Tower. Stahili took command and led the group, stating they would descend to Denali Pass and from there would have Cutler and Niederer shelter themselves while he kept pushing to get help. He stated that if they were to descend down the Autobahn on their own, they would die. Even with his injuries, Stahili knew this mountain. He had summited tens of times. He knew every second was important, and he descended the mountain like a madman, not only to raise a rescue team, but to keep himself warm. His climbing speed was literally the only thing keeping his body warm enough not to shut down. The group was unroped after the fall, which meant Cutler and Niederer could only follow Stahili on sight, but he was moving fast, way faster than the other climbers could manage. Cutler followed him as long as he could and Niederer behind him until he could see nothing but white landscape and rocks, and every now and then the pickets they had used as anchors on the way up as their only guide down. Stahili reached Zebra Rock at 18,600 feet and waited for the two climbers there. It took only minutes for Cutler to reach him, but the winds were blowing up to 80 miles an hour at this point, enough to blow any man off of his feet. Both men were cold brutally cold. Stahili could wait no longer, and at 1 a.m. after 10 minutes of waiting, he turned his back and began descending. It was every man for themselves as survival instincts took over. The two men would never see Niederer again. Stahili was moving too fast for Cutler again, and after reaching Denali Pass, he never let up his pace through the dangerous Autobahn. It was 3.30 a.m., when with closed fists and black fingers, he stumbled into high camp barely able to speak. Stahili would not have survived another hour. It did not take long for the rescue team to move into action after being notified by assistant guide John McGee, who was at the high camp. Meanwhile, Cutler was at the bottom of Denali Pass and the top of the Autobahn, unsure of his next move. If he was to try his luck down, he was sure he was going to die but if he stayed, he would freeze to death at the mercy of the screaming winds and no shelter. He made the impossible decision that he would rather spend his last moments fighting for his life than waiting for help he didn't know would ever come. He took the first step into the Autobahn. It was a hellish descent. The winds and snow had made his surroundings a whiteout even in the dead of the morning. His only guide was the pickets left behind from the 2010 climbing season, marking the route through the crevasse littered glacier. At one point, following the small markers blindly, Cutler took the wrong turn, following an old route and nearly stepped into a gaping crack in the ice. He saw nothing but black. Breathing a sigh of relief, he was nearly swallowed by the mountain. He slowly turned around, aware of every step and retraced his path up the mountain until he found the correct path. Meanwhile, above 19,200 feet on the football field, O'Sullivan had lost to Healy's parka in the winds. His fingers and toes no longer had any feeling. He did the only thing that he could do. He began to crawl, to not only try to keep whatever warmth he could in his body, but to give him a purpose. He crawled through the 80 miles an hour winds, he crawled all through the night as Stahili and Cutler descended the mountain. He crawled until his limbs were numb. He crawled until he could no longer pull the weight of his body, his arms and legs limp. He was ready for the end. It was 4.30 a.m. and Cutler was a third of the way down the glacier when he saw the lights bobbing up and down in the distance. At first, he didn't know what he saw. He thought he was dreaming and then it came to him. McGee and another guide at the high camp had reached Cutler an hour after Stahili had sent the men into action. 
Cutler couldn't cry because of the temperatures. He could only keep moving, one step after another, now in the company of others. He was overwhelmed, but did not want to believe that he was going to live. He had made up his mind that he was going to die, and there was nothing that anyone could do or say about that. But now, he was alive. They reached the high camp, and soon Cutler was in a tent, warming his frostbitten limbs. He had made it, even when the man who was to guide them all said he couldn't. The winds were straight out of a nightmare, blowing over the snow walls in the high camp, leaving the tents exposed. They could no longer resume rescue efforts. As the sun rose on a new day, the winds began to subside, and at 9 a.m., the Alaska Air National Guard was airborne. The height they would need to fly was extremely dangerous, but if anyone was still alive, they were the only hope. There would be no ground rescue. At 9.16 a.m., the C-130 Hercules spotted a man on the football field, a trail of his body stretching 800 feet through the snow behind him. He had crawled over 800 feet off the path through the snow and ice to a rock outcropping that had protected him from the wind. The team took note and minutes later found another man near Denali Pass. Neither men were moving, and the crew could do nothing but wait for the weather to further subside to attempt to rescue. They made several attempts to reach O'Sullivan through the day, but nothing was working. An Alaskan Ranger Erickson suggested they perform a short haul. This is when the group would hang a rope attached to a harness and basket below the chopper. The issue is, nobody would be able to descend, so it would be up to O'Sullivan, if he was still alive, to strap himself in and climb into the basket, then hang below the aircraft. It was their only option, and at 7 p.m. on May 12th, the team would fly out again to the football field with the harness and rope dangling from the bottom of the aircraft. O'Sullivan, lying on his back, saw the chopper fly over him. In fact, he had seen it multiple times throughout the day, but this was different. He could see the basket. It was set in the snow near him. He could no longer feel his legs or arms, but he knew that this was his only chance. He somehow willed himself, wiggling his body towards safety. He doesn't recall exactly how he got in, but he did. Then he was in the air, free from the mountain, a feeling he would never forget. While O'Sullivan flew overhead, Ranger Wright was making his way up Denali Pass to the last remaining man on the mountain. It was not long before he reached Niederer. His face was slumped, and Wright knew that he had not made it through the night. He was hunched over in the fetal position, trying to shelter as best as he could as he was instructed to do so. He had frozen to death on the mountain. O'Sullivan survived the mountain. They had all survived, except for Niederer, who gave his life that day. O'Sullivan would lose all of his fingers, both thumbs, and part of one foot because of frostbite. Stahili would lose the tips of all of his fingers as well. In the aftermath, a lot of blame was put on Stahili, but he was faced with impossible decisions and made choices that he thought were the best in the moment. There were strict regulation changes regarding the necessary gear for guides up the mountain after the incident. Niederer gave his life on that mountain after reaching the summit. He saw the world as very few have. The harsh reality, yet reward, of the Great One. This is Monte Rosa Massif. A group of mountains with over 10 peaks above 4,000 meters, located between Switzerland and Italy. The sheer scale of the neighboring peaks and glaciers would be intimidating to most, but it is a climber's paradise that only a few places in the world offer. Some mountain summits can be reached and descended in one day, while others require more experience and effort to reach the pinnacle. Vincent Pyramid is one of these peaks that climbers can summit in a single trip. It is a common training peak standing at 4,215 meters, lying at the southernmost part of the group. But don't let its neighboring peaks and reputation fool you. It is still a giant peak that can easily punish those that are unprepared. 
the three Italians that set out to reach the summit would soon realize just how difficult their journey would be. This is their story. Vincent Pyramid is entirely located in the Italian territory of the Monte Rosa group. As its name suggests, it is a true pyramid with four ridges that lead to the summit. Most climbers are able to summit the mountain in one day because of the base camp at the valley floor that is accessed through a lift coming from two sides. The northwest side contains the Lice Glacier, which makes it more difficult for those trying to test their skills. The many crevasses that litter the glacier are often hidden, especially early in the summer. This causes climbers to ascend and descend with a rope attached to all members of the group in order to prevent a stray climber from taking a wrong step and falling into the dark void. The most common route up the mountain is from the northwest side starting from the base camp in the valley below. Climbers would enter the Lice Glacier and follow the route diagonally to the northeast along a steep ramp watching out for hidden crevasses. Climbers would then turn north on moderate ice slopes following the path in between the obvious crevasses. This is where the climb already starts to ease, as there are less hidden dangers below. After passing through a series of irregular slopes, you would soon reach a snowy basin below Bailmanhorn at about 4,000 meters. You would make the final turn to the right and climb the northwest slope of Vincent Pyramid, which is usually well traced in the summer months as there could be several groups throughout the mountain on a single day. The weather is not as unpredictable as other mountains such as Denali, so it is a great spot to train and test your climbing skills. Many climbers visit the peak and summit the multiple interconnected mountains during their trip. It is not a typical mountain that requires rescues, yet it still demands the respect of those attempting to summit, as 4,000 meters plus is no small feat. On Saturday, July 3rd, 2021, three Italians decided they wanted to reach the summit of Vincent Pyramid even though there was a prediction of bad weather to come later in the day. 29-year-old Martina Svalupo and 28-year-old Paola Viscardi were joined by their 27-year-old male friend Valerio Zola to take on the perceived easy high-altitude climb. They would approach the mountain from the Italian side and climb up the northwest path from the base camp. Their plan was to reach the summit and descend the mountain before the winds and low clouds rolled in. If they were caught on the mountain when the weather turned, it would make the climb significantly worse. But the group was not worried. Whether it was foolishness or being naive, we would never fully understand what led to that decision but they would set out from the base camp with the summit on their minds. All three climbers came prepared in light mountaineering gear. Since the climb and descend would be in one day, there was no need to bring enough supplies for an overnight trip. After they set out, they quickly realized they were the only group on the popular mountain, but were rather happy about having a clear trail and made good time traversing the lower part of the slope. From base camp, it looked rather odd watching the faint outline of three individuals climb the glacier alone. On any other day, you would see a trail of climbers, but not today. The path that Martina, Paola, and Valerio walked on was easy to follow since it was heavily used during the season. In fact, the entire path to the summit is pretty straightforward, so they couldn't help but have smiles on their faces as they walked step after step with their light jackets and gear on. Martina and Paola were best friends and loved to climb together to share in the joys of reaching a summit. They had spoken particularly about this trip and were thrilled to be here. It was late morning by the time they reached the last stretch and everything was going great, but there was a light wind that was getting stronger by the hour. Yet there was no turning back. They were so close. Feeling slightly out of breath, they pushed on and reached the summit just after noon. Although 4,000 meters is less than half the size of mountains such as Everest and K2, it was still an incredible sight. Martina and Paola first noticed how small the summit was and just how many neighboring peaks there were. But nonetheless, they stood on top in an embrace while Valerio snapped a few pictures for them. They were exhausted, yet exhilarated. Their huge smiles beamed on all three of their faces. This is what it was all about. They rested on the summit for a couple of minutes, yet as they looked out, 
there were clouds already setting in below them, and the wind was noticeably worse than at any other point throughout their climb. The trio looked at each other as their smiles slowly began to fade. Reality had set in, and they were only halfway done with their trip. So, with mixed emotions of what was yet to come, yet still riding the high of reaching the top of the peak, they took their first steps down the slope, making their way towards the basin below Bailmanhorn. They had climbed through the low clouds on the way to the summit, disappearing into the white wall of mist that blended into the slope. The sun shining on their backs one second, then gone the next as they entered the cloud. They were forced to walk with little space in between them, as any more than a few feet would cause one to lose sight of the person in front of you. The trio was initially concerned by the mist, but they were there for a reason, so with no hesitation, they continued walking with determination on their faces. They walked on the path down the mountain, one step then another. Yet after 10 to 20 minutes of walking, they continuously looked at each other's faces. Their looks said all the words that could not escape their lips. Nobody was sure of where they were. The path was not the same as before, and yet they could not see more than a few feet 360 degrees around themselves. To make matters worse, soon after they left the summit, the winds had picked up dramatically. The weather had turned for the worse, with temperatures dropping to negative 4 degrees Celsius, but the wind chill made it feel like negative 15 degrees Celsius. Their smiles were long gone, and the path could no longer be found as the wind constantly blew snow around as if it was weightless. The trio was truly lost. They were prepared for the climb, but they had not prepared for this type of weather, and their light jackets and clothes could not protect them from the harsh cold. Their teeth started to chatter as they continued to walk, yet all they heard was the howl of the wind in their ears. All three felt the fear radiating from each other, but nobody could admit it. The mountain was screaming as a warning, telling them that they were not supposed to be there. Following a safe path was a genuine concern, as falling into a crevasse would mean certain death. All three were quiet as they walked, as speaking would have done no good. The chill of the mountain hitting their cheeks like a slap in the face. They had the same thought in their heads as they walked. This could not last long. After a couple minutes of being unable to accept defeat, they finally gave in. Luckily, one of the few items they did bring was a satellite phone. So, the trio pulled it out and made the first call to the rescue center in Aosta at 2 p.m. They were unable to provide their exact location as the group simply did not know where they were. And while they were on the phone, they heard a sharp click, barely audible above the wind. Their call had dropped. They pressed the emergency keys again and again trying to reach anyone, but the storm made it impossible. It slowly sunk in as they looked at each other. They were alone. In the valley below, rescue teams began to get ready, along with a couple miles away a helicopter fueling up to help in any way, even if this meant flying into a dangerous storm. Within minutes, they were in the air flying head first into the low clouds that had settled on the mountain. Martina, Paola, and Valerio huddled together as the wind raged around them. They covered their faces, or as best as they could with their light clothes. They had looked for any refuge or cover from the wrath of the elements, but there was nothing, nothing but snow. When suddenly they heard a noise overhead, it was difficult to make out over the wind, but a distinct noise. They instantly recognized. It was a helicopter. They could not move, so they did the only thing they could. They tried to make another call. This time, it worked, and Valerio shouted through the phone that the helicopter was right above them. The air rescue team continued flying over the mountain, despite the storm looking for any signs of life. But even as the winds began to calm, it was difficult to make anything out along the white slope. It had been a few hours since they were notified of a trio of climbers who needed help, and they were beginning to lose hope of finding them. The pilot was becoming anxious as the fuel gauge had slowly moved closer and closer to the bright red E in the bottom left corner as he flew. 
They did not have long, but he had to continue flying. He had to find them. It was late afternoon when he saw a small dot on the mountainside near the summit, and as he flew closer and closer, he knew it was them. There was no possible way of him making a safe landing in this weather, but he had accomplished his job. He picked up his radio and let the ground team know the good news. He had found the climbers at roughly 4,150 meters. He was able to land lower on the mountain below the clouds, and there he waited for the ground team. The rescuers had already entered the storm and had been climbing for over an hour. It was strange how quickly the weather had turned. One minute it was clear snow, and another they were surrounded by blizzard temperatures and low clouds. A few rescuers believed in the omens of the mountain, and it was clear that they were not supposed to be there. Yet they knew three young climbers needed their help, so they walked on. Once receiving direction from the air rescue team, roughly an hour prior, they made quick work through the snow, as all ground members were familiar with the mountain. Determination littered the faces of the group as they walked, one step after another, following the man in front of you, when suddenly there was a small dark jacket poking above the snow. They had reached the group. Three heads poked up as they heard the shouting voices over the wind. They saw the group walking towards them, but only Valerio was able to speak at this point. They were all shaking violently, their bodies fighting the cold the only way it could. Rescuers quickly checked Martina, Valerio, and Paola, but their faces were distraught. There was no time, as both Martina and Paola were in bad shape. Martina was in late stages of hypothermia, and her body was starting to give up. She was in what is known as the hide and die syndrome. They had to get her down the mountain, now. So the group, with the waves of emotion of newfound energy, turned away from the summit and began descending the mountain. Valerio was able to stand on his own and walk with the group, yet could do nothing but follow the man in front of him. Martina and Paola could not move on their own and would have to be carried off the mountain. The group of rescuers did not skip a beat, strapping both girls into their respective rescue baskets and starting to descend. Although they made good time, it was still hours of climbing before they were able to reach the helicopter. Hours of laying in the cold for Martina and Paola, shaking violently as the winds continued to rage around them. But they hung on, and soon the helicopter was in sight. The rescuers did not stop walking even after the winds and clouds faded away. They still felt the shaking basket, which gave them hope that there was still a chance. They made it to the helicopter. They had done it. The air rescue team pulled all three climbers into the bird that sat on the lower part of the glacier of Vincent Pyramid. It stood out against the white surroundings as a beacon of hope. But something was wrong. As soon as they pulled the trio into the helicopter, they had taken off, but Martina was no longer shaking. She was no longer moving at all. It was too late. They jumped into action, attempting CPR and rubbing their warm hands on her body in an attempt to warm her up. The look of hope long gone from their faces as they flew above the mountain. They tried to bring her back, but it was in vain. She was gone. Their faces sunk. They had fought for so long and were so close, but their job was not done. They were able to reach the Montova refuge, but Valerio was the only member still conscious. Paola's chest was slowly rising and falling. She was breathing, but barely. They quickly got her off the chopper and into the refuge where doctors got to work. Hours went by, but Paola still had not opened her eyes. It was dark outside, and Valerio waited patiently for any news. His head held in his hands as he waited. He had made it, but was hardly able to digest his emotions. He still felt nothing but fear and despair. Later in the night, as doctors continued to work, they heard a deep inhale, and everyone freezed for a second. Then a long exhale, and there was no other breath. Paola had joined her best friend. Valerio was the only member of the group that survived the climb. Martina and Paola passed away due to frostbite, with Martina entering cardiac arrest soon after reaching the helicopter. 
Both were simply best friends who loved mountains in biology. Months before the incident, Paolo would post, we will return to hug each other in our mountains, a tribute to their love. This tragedy serves as a reminder of the dangers that lie on all mountains, whether it be 8,000 meters or 4,000. Mother Nature always deserves our respect.